And the next big alien invasion blockbuster movie, I am pretty sure we will see the F-35s. And it is pretty justified, to be honest, because what they're trying to do with the Block 4 is borderline science fiction. What I'm trying to do in this video is to explain what the Technology Refresh 3 and the Block 4 bring to the F-35 table. There were about 75 specific upgrades included in the TR3 and the Block 4 software, many of them secret, and many others seem to have been made public, but, well, without too much detail. Why is this important? Because the Block 4 is the first F-35 standard that fully satisfies the original specifications of the aircraft. I know, it seems incredible, but the aircraft that have been delivered so far are not considered fully operational, uh, in practice they are, and the aircraft itself is not in full production rate. All the aircraft produced so far in August 2023, which are more than 900, are expected to be retrofitted to the Block 4 standard. This will happen to some extent, but it will be very expensive. For example, the UK and Italy have already decided that, at least for now, they're not updating their aircraft. And about 150 early production aircraft cannot physically be updated to the Block 4 standard, and, uh, well, some of them have been relegated to the role of aggressors, which is still quite useful, I suppose, but yeah. As I said many times, it is incredible how such a poorly conceived and run program may have produced such an outstanding aircraft. However, the Block 4 updates include both hardware and software upgrades. Part of these updates, mostly related to the avionics, go under the name of Technology Refresh 3, and the first modified aircraft has already flown in January 2023. The bulk of the updates, hardware and software, is expected to progressively enter service and be delivered in 2028. Yep, 2028. Which seems a long time from now. Well, if it seems a long time from now, it is because it is a long time. It is a fact that the F-35 software is riddled with issues. Not because it doesn't work well enough, uh, when it's working, it's working very well, the problem is that it was supposed to be modular and easy to update, but it turned out to be a nightmare. And in fact, the tests on the aircraft equipped with the TR-3 are not going well. Thanks to the idea of concurrency, the aircraft are already being produced, but they will be stored and not delivered till the software issues related to the TR-3 won't be fixed. If this seems like the umpteen failure of the F-35 program, it is because it is. However, this was always a project destined for tons of failures before doing it right. The real news is that the project wasn't cancelled or heavily downsized upon these failures. But this is a different story and I leave this to the future aviation historians to tell. However, since today I feel like trolling a bit, stuff like that happened in the Soviet Union, for example with the early Suhoi 27 that were produced without the radar, stored, and then retrofitted later. Sir, I am under the obligation to warn you about the possibility of disappointing a large amount of our All audience. Of facts are facts and they are what they are and they're pretty stubborn. Well, this is a human perspective, I suppose. Trust me, Otis, facts are stubborn and they don't really care which side are you on. Okay, moving on. The F-35 has a rather peculiar system of classifying all the versions. To be honest, I'm not really sure there are really versions, because the aircraft is designed to be continuously updated. In theory, it should receive a software update every six months, and minor updates in between. In practice, the process is working on and off, and the aircraft is not stranger to experiencing uh, software regressions. For those who don't know what it means, it means that during the update, they break something that was working. It is like when your favorite software that you're using every day receives an update and a feature that was working fine suddenly stops working. 
While I'm recording in August 2023, the current version is the Block 3F. Mind that this has nothing to do with the three variants A, B, and C. All three, despite the differences, have the same systems, so they can use the same hardware and the same software to a very, very large extent. The block designation refers mostly to software, while the hardware upgrades are called technology refreshes, which remind me of those pine-shaped deodorants that you used to hang in the car in the 90s, and I don't know why. The block production is then split in lots, so Lockheed Martin current production run is a batch of 389 aircraft for the US and the international customers, consisting in 145 Lot 15 aircraft with the TR3 and the modified Block 3F software as a baseline, 127 Lot 16 jets and an option for 126 Lot 16 aircraft for Finland, Belgium and Poland to be delivered with all the Block 4 capabilities. Not all the software blocks will run on all the technology refreshes. In fact, the Block 4 software will require the technology refresh 3, but the 3F version has issues running on it, as we have seen. I hope you don't have a headache by now. However, despite all these setbacks, the concept is extremely important. This approach is called Continuous Capability Development and Delivery, C2D2. Uh, it sounds a bit like Star Wars, does it? And C2D2 is a fundamental aspect of the F-35 program. Yes, because on the F-35, a disproportionately large fraction of the capabilities is driven by software. In the program, they call the aircraft itself the air vehicle, as if it was just a container uh, to host and lug around the, the software and the sensors. The flight performance is almost an afterthought. Um, so if this is true, particularly in case of hostilities, it is essential to be able to quickly react and deploy new software to adapt to the opponent. So far, the software has been by far the most problematic element in the whole program, but we may expect that when it works, it really works. And actually, the Block 3F is already doing pretty well from this point of view. For example, we know that US F-35s have conducted missions in stealth mode near the Ukrainian airspace to collect electronic data about the ongoing operations. Generic comments have been released about the aircraft working very well. I personally wouldn't be surprised if some missions had been executed within Ukrainian airspace, but obviously at a safe distance from the Russian assets, always with the purpose of collecting information and testing the aircraft systems. It would, it would really be interesting to learn whether the Russian low-frequency radars are noticing their presence or not. The Israeli Air Force has conducted similar missions in Syria and rumors, rumors say, over Iran. In fact, there are several declarations by Iranian officials that the aircraft is visible on their low-frequency systems, which is something which is totally expected, but, well, okay, this is not the subject of this video. So to conclude this part, I personally believe that the aircraft was introduced in service too early, and such an extreme concurrency in production was and is a bad idea. But when things are finally set straight, it works as expected, and it is very, very effective. The problem have been originated mostly by the poor program management rather than the poor design of the aircraft. However, this video is about the technology refresh tree and the Block 4, so let's focus on the improvements one by one. With a big caveat, there seems to be a lot of information about the subject out there, but the Air Force and Lockheed Martin have mastered the art of not saying anything while talking a lot. I'm trying to interpret the open source information available at the best of my possibilities, but nothing is set in stone. Block 4 improvements are focused on software, with some hardware improvements both to the system and the air vehicle. Contrary to what I have heard by some, Block 4 doesn't include a new engine for the aircraft or an improved one. 
The soap opera around adapting the brand new General Electric X100 engine for the F-35 ended with the defeat of General Electric. The aircraft will not receive the new variable cycle engine, but in the future there will be an improvement program for the F-35 engine. But this is not part of the Block 4 improvements. The approach to the delivery of the Block 4 upgrades is the same incremental approach that we have described above. So the 2028 delivery date is not really a milestone and the aircraft should progressively acquire these capabilities. Probably the main hardware update is the aircraft radar. The AN-APG-81 radar of the F-35 was considered already a state-of-the-art unit, so when the new radar was announced by appearing as a single line in a budgetary document, it was a surprise for many, including myself. This would be a hardware upgrade, but it's not included in the TR-3 and it will come later with Block 17 aircraft. We made a couple of videos already about the F-35 radar and AISA radars in general. Built by Northrop Grumman, the APG-81 in particular has introduced the capability of addressing its 1,676 module to a granularity level capable of managing different functions, even non-radar related, with a single AISA array. In fact, the radar is not only capable of producing a beam and listening to the echoes, which is the basic function of every radar, it can probably emit multiple beams on different frequencies, changing frequency hundreds of times per second and throttling the power emitted to be just sufficient for the purpose without being a too obvious source of emissions that could be identified by the opponent's electronic support measures. This is the LPI technology which has been around for decades but it finds its more effective application in AISA radars. If that was not enough, the radar can digitally produce a large variety of waveforms that can be used for target recognition, which is one of the key capabilities that the F-35 is bringing to the table. But the radar can also emit and receive typical communication waveforms, so it can be used as a radio or as a data link, uh, more likely particularly to guide the weapons, or it can be used for the IFF function or for jamming the opponent's radars or potentially its communications. The ANAPG-81 peak power has never been disclosed, but it seems to be in the high range of the category. Why did I talk about the ANAPG-81, the legacy radar, so much? Well, because we really know nothing about the ANAPG-85, but the common opinion seems to be that it will be well, more of the same. It won't add any specific capability, but it will improve the performance in terms of range, sensitivity, and crucially, processing power. Since the APG-81 is built with semiconductors based on um, gallium arsenide technology, it seems only reasonable that the APG-85 will be built with gallium nitride semiconductors. These are the next generation and, and have several advantages over the older technology. And while well, they're now basically mainstream, but a complete discussion would take us too far. It's enough to say that the power being handled is likely going to increase. Some additional functions are mentioned in the sources. For example, the APG-85 will have a new software for sea surveillance and the possibility of using synthetic aperture to increase the definition of the radar images. You should explain what synthetic aperture is. Uh, true what is, but it would take us too far from the original subject of the video. For now, it is enough to say that it is a technique that uses the antenna motion with the aircraft to increase the resolution of the radar images. Well, it's no use to say how important passive sensing is in today's electronic environment. An aircraft using a radar or emitting any form of electromagnetic radiation can, in principle, be identified by detecting those emissions. If the aircraft is just listening to the opponent's emissions, it has way less chances of being detected. Since the beginning, one of the main goals of the F-35 was the capability to generate fire solutions for the onboard weapons completely passively. With optical or infrared sensors, it is, well, conceptually easy. They are accurate enough. 
thanks to the very short wavelengths of light and infrared, so they can produce a pinpoint designation. Determining the distance is more complicated, it requires a triangulation and the F-35 closed loop sensor fusion system is built from the ground up to do this automatically for every track if at at least a second F-35 is within data link communication range, and it is obviously observing the same target. Mind, this is conceptually not too complex, but in practice, to make it work automatically in real operating conditions, while the aircraft fly around in a random way, it is quite an achievement, albeit not exclusive to the F-35. Quite surprisingly though, the F-35 is not fully supporting this type of fusion right now. The TR3 includes an improvement to the EOTS optics and sensors. This will allow for the improvement in the air to ground detection modes, allowing the tracking of multiple targets and finally, finally, multi-ship infrared search and track. The infrared search and track function is not like a camera or a forward-looking infrared. While an Earth can generate images, its function is to scan the space surrounding the aircraft to identify infrared tracks. An Earth works like a radar without the possibility of calculating the distance. This is the reason why data fusion from two or more infrared search and track is essential. With the Block 4 software, a multi-ship Earth function will be finally available. This is something that is already available in US in the Legion pod for the F-16s and the F-15s, so it is a bit perplexing that it isn't on the F-35 right now. The EOTS system is also receiving updates to the optics and the laser designator. It should increase the practical range by additional zoom magnification. The system is expected to provide high definition video to the pilot and streaming 4K to other consumers, like for example friendly forces on the ground. Uh, which is cool, definitely, but nothing special since drones have been doing this for decades. Maybe at a lower resolution, but yeah. And it begs the question, if you want to have a relatively vulnerable aircraft like the F-35 hovering over a battle zone, while lightweight surface to air weapons like man pads or AAA may still be there, since they are too small targets for the initial suppression of our defenses campaign. Anyway, if I understand the source correctly, this 4K streaming is an interim capability that should improve in the future and be joined with real-time streaming of targeting data. However, optical and infrared sensors usually have shorter ranges than electromagnetic systems and they are more heavily influenced by the weather and the atmospheric conditions. Today, electronic warfare extends throughout the electromagnetic spectrum in all the frequencies and the F-35 covers most of it with its own systems and receivers. In fact, the ANISQ-239 electronic warfare suite produced by BI Systems is one of the most advanced in the world if not the most advanced. It is integrated, that is, there is a single control brain for all the sensors. It is modular and built with an open architecture to accommodate improvements. It is multispectral, that is, it features several antennas dedicated to different frequencies. And this is one of the cases in which Lockheed Martin and the Air Force seem to say a lot while saying nothing. Each antenna in the associate control electronics is labeled with a frequency number from two to five, but nobody knows what these numbers correspond to. I mean, the actual frequencies. Uh, so it is a completely useless information. However, there are several antennas on the aircraft. Some of them are being upgraded with their control electronics to achieve an improved sensitivity. And probably even more important is the update of the racks 2A and 2B, which are the core of the system and contain the logic that creates track information for the central computer. I would expect that the signal processing executed in these boxes is the key to identify low power signal and extract them from the background noise. In theory, being the F-35 systems completely software defined, they can be used to listen to every type of signal and classify it to extract useful tracks for the central computer to work on. 
it is unclear, at least to me, where the track identification process exactly happens. And if it is happening on these uh, electronic warfare boards or it is a task that is passed on to the central computer, which is one of the elements being upgraded with the TR3, as we will see later. These boards should also control the electronic warfare in the sense that they are probably responsible to decide which type of waveform should be emitted to jam an opponent emitter. With multiple antennas and software-defined radios, the aircraft can probably emit various jump signals all at the same time, but, well, this is just speculation. One interesting feature of the F-35 is the so-called DAS, Distribute Aperture System. It is a complex of six infrared panoramic cameras that produce an spherical augmented reality vision in the pilot's helmet as if the aircraft was transparent. The origin of this feature was in the radar stealth signature management of the aircraft. If the aircraft banks, the RCS varies quite drastically and in generally increases. So the DAS was supposed to provide the pilot with the visibility necessary without changing the aircraft attitude. With time the feature evolved and now pilots consider it one of the main contributors to their situational awareness. Inbound threat warnings are presented by the DAS giving the pilot an immediate 3D sensation of the situation and the same is true for aircraft identified by the other aircraft sensors. Some sources laterally admit that the feature is really addictive and after a short while the pilot starts wondering wondering how it was done before. And this has the drawback that in the few situations where it fails to identify a relevant track, the pilots tend to be taken entirely by surprise, and obviously this has become part of the fifth generation training. This is often considered the most revolutionary feature on the F-35, right after the possibility of peeing without any trafficking. Yes, because on the F-35, the pilot suit is such that the sensors automatically detect the pee and the pump keeps it away from the pilot, either male or female, uh, which means that there will be a certified stealth pee tank on the aircraft that needs to be emptied and sanitized, but it also may introduce a vulnerability because if hit by enemy fire, it could drop liquid on electronic components with obvious consequences. But I digress. The upgrade included in the Block 4 is expected to fix a long-standing problem related to the resolution and the quality of the images produced by the DAS in total obscurity, which is deemed to be too low for some of the use cases. On the F-35, the intership communication is essential. The aircraft is designed to be operated in two or four ship units because this allows for the best performance of sensor fusion, where each aircraft becomes a sensor in a network. The model data link was designed to transparently support this data exchange in the stealthier way possible, which means that it supports directional beam forming and regulates the power to be just enough to communicate and remain inconspicuous. Now, these are both technologies that have been in use in civilian systems for a couple of decades, but older data links like the Link 16, well, just don't use them. The aircraft, as we said, is equipped with fully software-defined radios. That is, as you may expect, there is no specific hardware to generate a waveform or implement a communication protocol. It is all done by software. The F-35s, in fact, communicate among themselves with the model, but they use legacy data links to communicate with other assets. For example, the aircraft can communicate on the Link 16 and share its tracks on it with other assets. And this is the reason why the F-35s are considered force multipliers for fourth generation aircraft. They can share the very high quality tracks that they do generate for themselves, obviously with fewer details, uh, with all the other aircrafts providing them a better situational awareness. For example, since the F-35 has this advanced way of identifying non-cooperative targets, they can identify a threat that may be just an unidentified blip on the radar of other aircraft and share the information with them. This is crucial, for example, to, to use the weapons at maximum range uh, without a positive visual identification. 
However, the communication suite that is currently installed might not be considered complete, and this is going to be addressed by the Block 4 software. In fact, the Link16 integration will be implemented by introducing legacy cryptographic modes and variable messages. This allows for richer content to be transmitted over Link16. And the aircraft will also receive the Saturn waveform, which is one of the standards in use within NATO and with other countries around the world. The F-35 has basically the entire cockpit instrumentation replaced by a panoramic touch display. This is the tendency ongoing today. Most modern projects have one or max two big displays used for everything. One of the reasons the display is being replaced is that it turned out to become dirty with fingerprints despite the gloves uh, quite quickly. Well, when it comes to keeping stuff clean, uh, they should probably talk with my mom. But this is just a trivial point. In the F-35 display, there is some intelligence associated with it. The unit is driven by two black boxes called PCD-EU, each one driving one half of the display for redundancy. It is not the main software that draws a picture on the cockpit like you would do with a video game. These units are information consumers within the F-35. They do receive the full tracks from the fusion engine and they then draw the picture for the pilot. But this is not their only function. They manage both safety and non-safety critical processes which is another case where they say a lot while saying nothing, but they also control power distribution and signal traffic. For these reasons, the PCD use will be upgraded for the Block 4, increasing the processing power by 4 and memory by 32 times. One interesting additional function of the PCD U units is the capability of working as a logger for the aircraft diagnostic events and the display video. These seems details, but they are fundamental for maintenance, the briefing and studying the lessons learned through training and operations. It also seems that in the Block 4 software, the presentation on the screen is going to be changed, building on the lessons learned in these years of operations in order to be, well, clearer and more easily readable, uh, particularly at night. It also seems that new customization options will be available, allowing the pilot to sort of tailor the layout of the screen um, according to his own or her own preferences. The F-35 cooling is another of those F-35 soap operas that never stop giving. Considering the amount of electronics on the aircraft, cooling is an essential function on the F-35. The F-35 cooling system is very advanced and it integrates the electrical power generation with it. In the original project, there was a design requirement to drain 15 kilowatts of power from the engine for cooling. The aircraft has been built with some margin above that, but as the project developed, the power consumption increased and all the margins went exhausted. The aircraft in the first versions had several cooling problems, including the necessity of opening the weapons bay every 30 minutes or so to cool the interior. These issues have been mostly resolved, but in hot climates, the aircraft may still have cooling issues in the weapons bay that may push the internal temperature above the operating point of some electronics. The current aircraft remedy for this is running the engine at a slightly higher rev when cruising. This means that the turbine entry temperature is higher on average than designed. In general, and simplifying a lot, the capability of an engine to withstand higher turbine entry temperatures is connected with the thrust and the power produced. Since the Pratt & Whitney 135 is already a hot engine derived from the Pratt & Whitney 119 of the F-22, this small increase is making a difference. It is making a difference about the mean time between overhauls of the engine, which is reported to be on average 1700 hours against the 2100 hours design point. This may not be right. Yes. Yes, that, that's true, that's true. For a modern Western engine, it is a relatively short time, albeit not scandalous. And the fact that the cause is the engine running at a slightly higher temperature gives room to the suspicion that in wartime, when caution is thrown to the wind and the engine is used at the max, it would require more maintenance than others. 
So a solution needed to be found, and in fact, there is a competition ongoing to redesign the system, improve its efficiency, and leave some headroom for future developments. So much for any green consideration. At the moment, Honeywell seems to be the best positioned in the race, having tested the first subsystem prototype in early 2023, pushing it to a power generation about 2.2 times the current level. There is one feature of the F-35 which is extremely popular in video games and it is the ability to carry six AMRAMs in the weapon base. As it stands, this is not happening. This is a Lockheed Martin private initiative called Sidekick to fit into the base of the F-35A and C six missiles. Uh, this is not a contracted capability, it is not related to Block 4, and it can be delivered independently. For example, it seems that the Canadian F-35s will be delivered with the sidekick installed. It is not clear whether it could be retrofitted to existing aircraft or not. What is sure is that, that the F-35B that features smaller internal bays cannot receive the sidekick upgrade. Anyway, there are several weapon systems that are going to be integrated with the F-35 in the context of the Block 4 modifications. And please mind, the integration is more than mechanically mounting the weapon on the aircraft. Integrating a weapon indeed has a mechanical part in which the weapon is attached to the aircraft and tested in different flight conditions, launch profiles and environmental conditions. Uh, the separation at different speeds, attitudes or while maneuvering is a delicate aspect that may hide surprises and it needs to be thoroughly tested in the wind tunnel and live on the aircraft. And then the aircraft must be capable of communicating with the weapon to turn it on, test it, download the fire solution or the communication parameters and so on. So adding a weapon to an aircraft is a project on itself and it may be complex and expensive. In fact, initiatives like the American Universal Armament Interface and the British Pyramid aimed at creating plug-and-play weapons and armament controllers, but, well, we are not there yet. However, there are several weapons that are going to be integrated within the Block 4 context. In the air-to-air domain, the AM9X Block 2 and above are being integrated. And staying on air-to-air, -air, we don't know what will happen with the AIM-260, which should be released uh, yeah, within months, but it seems logical that it will be integrated at some point, albeit it is not in the list for the Block 4. The to ground domain, the GBU-54 is being integrated. The GBU-54 is an advanced JDAM variant that combines the laser guidance with the GPS guidance. It is built on the base of a Mark 82 unguided bomb, which means that the nominal weight is uh, 225 kilos. And related to the GBU-54 is the GBU-38, another JDAM variant, in this case the light version with GPS and inertial guidance. Up one notch and we find the Joint Standoff Weapon, or JSO, or JSAW, or JSAW, JSO, J, okay, that, that one. It is a gliding bomb with a stealth body with inertial GPS guidance and terminal infrared. Despite being quite bulky, it fits inside the F-35 base. It is in use mostly with the Navy, but also with various foreign partners flying the F-35. Up one notch and we find the GBU-39 small diameter bomb. This is a well-known intelligent weapon which was expected to be integrated as part of the Block 4, but the program was brought forward and the weapon is already available. Up another notch and we find the Joint Strike Missile. This is an anti-ship weapon of Norwegian origin, which is currently in use, uh, uh, surface launched by the Norwegian Navy and several other navies around the world. It is extremely sophisticated and survivable. It will be integrated for the US Navy and the Norwegian Air Force. And this opens the list of the foreign weapons, the, I mean non-US weapons, that are going to be integrated with the F-35 Block 4. The British AIM-132 Azram was planned to be part of the Block 4, but it has been already integrated. It is an air-to-air -air weapon of the same class of the AIM-9X, and it is in use with the Royal Air Force and other 
air forces. On the other side, the integration with the Meteor has been pushed back to 2027. The Meteor is an air breathing, very long range air to air weapon. It is a multinational project in service with several European and extra European countries. Several observers consider it the most effective air to air weapon in service in the world today and the only one capable of trading blows with the long range Russian and Chinese air to air weapons. On the F-35, it should fit inside the base, and the integration has been requested by the UK and Italy. Another foreign weapon that will be integrated will be the Spear 3, a small cruise missile to attack air-to-ground targets and the suppression of air defenses. It is a British weapon, but it is still in development at the moment in 2023, and it is expected to enter service in 2028, when all these capabilities we are, we are talking about are going to be complete. And last but not least, let's come to the processing power. In fact, as part of the TR3, the aircraft will receive a custom-designed Harris processor to replace the legacy component produced by Lockheed Martin Rotary and Mission Systems. This component is called the Integrated Core Processor, ICP, because it sits in the middle of the F-35 hardware architecture. It runs an Integrity 178B operating system, a real-time POSIX-compliant implementation used in other combat and commercial aircraft. It executes the functions associated with the radar, the DAS with electronic warfare, communications, weapons, guidance, cockpit, helmet, and crucially, data fusion, and probably it can also be used as a kitchen sink. The new processor, in terms of raw processing power, is declared to be 25 to 37 times more capable of the current implementation. And Harris also says that they use commercial off-the-shelf components in the design of the processor, which is actually a, a white box rather than a single chip. Um, Harris says that they designed it with the, an open system architecture, giving a predetermined set of interfaces to the software developed. But does it, what does this mean is not entirely clear to me. The Pentagon has been promoting an OSA architecture for internet communication among systems for a while now, but I don't know if this design is related to that OSA because, uh, well, the details are classified. What puzzles me, though, is that it seems that the new processor is different from the old and it uses a different architecture. I wonder what the level of software compatibility is. So the F-35 software is written in C++, so in principle it should be possible to port it on different systems without too much hassle. However, in C you can access pretty low-level functions on the processor, depending on the way the software is written, there may be significant differences that may require an extensive rewrite. And in fact, as we have seen at the beginning, there have been issues of serious enough to induce the Air Force to reject all the aircraft built with the tier 3 components and wait for the problems to be fixed. Together with the processor comes a new aircraft memory system capable of 20 times the current storage, which, well, it's not surprising if we consider the age of the design of the original components. However, what is the point of such a processing power increase? Well, considering the speed at which hardware develops, again, the increment is not surprising since the original design is probably about 15, 20 years old by now. But this is not the only reason. After all, if it was adequate for what it was doing, there was no need of upgrade. The actual reason is deeply rooted into the whole operating concept of the F-35. A conventional aircraft architecture is a federation of systems. What is this? For example, the electronic warfare suite is a complex of black boxes and antennas with a computer in it. The computer controls the hardware and it communicates with other systems and with the presentation systems with a protocol made of messages of some sort. There is a level of abstraction between the subsystems and the central unit. In the case of the F-35, the ICP is expected to have a, a much more granular control on the hardware and in turn to receive more granular data that can be processed and fused centrally. The exact details are obviously classified, but we can make an easy to understand example. Let's suppose that the aircraft needs to communicate by voice with a ground unit with standard US singers radio. These radios use their own waveform and encryption, that is a standard protocol 
protocol to communicate and transmit the voice. In a modern aircraft, the pilot won't be using an actual radio placed somewhere in the cockpit, but the aircraft itself will manage the interface with a SyncGAR's black box, and the pilot will eventually use the multifunction displays and or the standard inputs to operate the radio. But this is not the case on the F-35. The ICP will directly drive one of the software-defined radios, which will manage the communication, emitting and receiving the correct encrypted waveform. In this way, the hardware on board of the F-35 is basically multifunction, and it can be repurposed as necessary by the ECP by changing the software. Having access to these very granular data, the ICP can execute its main function, that is, manage the tracks. We have discussed this in great detail in a series of videos in the past, and I suggest you to have a look, because the subject of how the F-35 manages the tracks is really interesting, fascinating, and it's very difficult to find anywhere else on YouTube. So to summarize, what is important to know is that the F-35 maintains records of what is detected. Each detection is called a track, and each track is associated with quite a large data set through sensors, the input of other F-35s and assets. Uh, the data set is progressively filled and updated till the aircraft has complete knowledge of the track. For example, in that data set, we have data about position and movement, as well uh, target recognition data, but also data about the configuration of the aircraft and so on. This function is the core of the F-35 effectiveness, and it defines the way the aircraft is expected to be employed in theater. While popular attention is focused on stealth and dynamic performance, don't get me wrong, are both very important, but they are not deal breakers, the actual superiority is expected to come from the enhanced situational awareness that two or better four F-35s working in combination can acquire in the operation operational theater. F-35's active and, crucially, passive sensors are the best that money can buy, and their output is rebuilt into a structure picture of the air battle similar to the God's Eye view found in video games. The communication tools built into the aircraft allow the sharing of this picture with other assets and ground control centers. And if this is true, it is intuitive how building this picture by managing the aircraft sensors and their output is a computationally heavy task. I'm only conjecturing here, but I can imagine that there are two specific tasks that, if made faster, could bring a substantial improvement to the process of creating situational awareness. The first is sensor management. As I said, we have already described the closed-loop sensor fusion in great detail in a different series of videos. Here we only recall that one of the steps is sensor management. On the F-35, the pilot is not managing the sensors other than in a very loose way. The pilot is not deciding radar frequencies, pulse, repetition, and so on. The aircraft does that. Every second, the system examines the tracks, identifies those that are more important for the F-35 formation, and it focuses the sensors on those to better characterize them. For example, what happens if another stealth aircraft suddenly appears on the radar? At first, it will be just an anonymous blip on the screen. Maybe be identified from few radar returns, but being stealth, it will likely be quite close to the F-35. Direction, altitude, and speed are easy to identify, but you need much more information and fast to determine if the aircraft needs reacting, if the aircraft that just appeared is a threat. The aircraft software running on the ICP will focus the sensors on that specific track. The radar will paint the target with waveforms suitable for target recognition. The optical and IA sensors will try to image it to pinpoint the direction and characterize the infrared signature. The electronic warfare suite will try to listen in the direction of the track to identify the electromagnetic emissions and so on. And this is what I mean when I'm saying that the F-35, under some aspects, is pure science fiction. However, it's quite intuitive how this process is computationally intensive. More raw power, even in the absence of any sensor hardware improvement, could reduce the time required for the process or could explore more tracks at the same time. And this brings us to the second task. Identifying that there is something there is easy. Identifying what it is is extremely difficult. 
the eye problem, sir. Mm, thank you, Otis, for reminding me. Every time I touch these issues, there is always someone in the comments trying to remind me that IFF systems exist just for that purpose. Well, no, no. IFF, despite the name, can only tell you whether a truck is friendly or not. The IFF system emits an electromagnetic pulse, querying the eventual truck a uh, compatible IFF system for an identification. If you don't have a positive reply, the truck may have the IFF off or malfunctioning. It could be a civilian aircraft without an IFF. In an air-to-ground mission, a tank doesn't have an IFF. Uh, consider a situation like Ukraine, where both sides are using what are basically different variants of the same vehicles. How do you tell a friend from a foe in an aircraft flying 40 kilometers from the target? And I even didn't mention that emitting the IFF signal exposes the emitter to the localization by the opponent's electronic warfare systems. So, no, IFF is useful, but is not a solution. Well said, sir. Thank you, Otis. So... My pleasure, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, let's go back to the problem of identifying a non-cooperative target. This is a subject that we have already covered in detail in a different video. The concept is to identify electromagnetic, thermal or less often optical signatures and compare them with a library of known signatures. The radar signal bouncing back from a target doesn't have the same waveform as the emitted signal. The reflected signal has micromodulations that can be traced back to a specific object or vehicle. A powerful enough signal processing capability can identify even loadout configurations and specific weapons or systems transported by the aircraft. Target is emitting either radar, radio, or jamming. It is giving away clues about its actual identity. Either emission patterns or specific waveforms can lead to an identification. And the same is true with infrared or visual emissions where characteristic patterns or periodicity can be used to determine the position and the orientation of the target with pinpoint accuracy. On the F-35, the pilot is not involved in all these processes. They are completely automated and transparent. The pilot just sees the screen being populated with all the available information. The pilot obviously has a measure of control, for example, prioritizing a different track for inquiry other than those selected by the system, but this is basically it. In a fifth generation aircraft, but even a 4++, plus plus, the pilot is not really supposed to mess around too much with the sensors because it will likely do more harm than good. But there is another reason why the pilot shouldn't mess with the sensors. One of the main sensors on the F-35 is, well, other F-35s. Through the model data link, a flight of aircraft in a loose formation exchange data and continuously and build a more comprehensive and accurate picture of the battle space that a single aircraft could ever do. This doesn't simply mean cover a larger area. That's nice, but not groundbreaking. The key point is that this approach greatly increases the accuracy accuracy of passive sensors to the point that it is possible to generate firing solutions in a completely passive manner, keeping the aircraft stealthy while doing so. This is a big advantage. Obviously, the opponents try to be stealthy too, so the conditions are not always present, but this is not a small feat, and it is one of the key advantages of the F-35 if compared with four-generation systems. And the obvious consequence is that if the aircraft acts as a sensor for all the others, every individual pilot should not mess around with the sensors too much, because it will deprive the entire group of critical information. So, all these processes of using the data and analyzing them against a database of signatures and threats are the core of the F-35 operational design. This means that there is a lot of signal processing and image processing going on at the, all at the same time. All these operations are computationally heavy and the increment of processing power is likely going to increase the number of tracks being processed at every loop and the accuracy of the analysis of the video feeds, particularly those coming from the DAS system. The threat libraries used by the F-35, the so-called mission data files, are also being up. These are large regional databases that contain 
all the information required by the F-35 to identify the threats. Uh, the world has been split into 12 areas, and a separate file is produced for each one. In the file, there are all the data required to correctly classify the tracks as they are encountered. The content of the files is constantly updated. The vast intelligence collection capability of the US is constantly at work to collect electromagnetic and infrared signatures. The F-35 itself is capable of producing data logs that can be integrated into the files. The activity of producing these files is absolutely crucial to give the F-35 its edge. Without the mission files, the capability of the aircraft is severely reduced, and in fact, there has been criticism that emerged in the past, like the difficulty to download hundreds of gigabytes of data over relatively slow satellite connections while on a ship in the middle of the sea or uh, in an austere air base, uh, rather than the lack of redundancy of the facilities required to produce the files, uh, rather the tendency of the Americans to produce the files according to their schedules rather than the allies' requirements. All of these are not issues that are going to be addressed by the Block 4 aircraft, but they are an example of the formidable complexity associated with the F-35 program, which I hope I managed to give you a taste of. To be perfectly honest, there is more stuff like the integration of the GPS system on uh, PCB, multi-level security, the change from Alice to Odin, but this video is already long enough and my back is already painful enough and I have to finish preparing it for the publication very, very quickly. So, thank you very much for getting this far in the video. I really appreciate that. Thank you for giving me your time. I consider this a privilege and a honor. As you may know, overall, in the last year and a half, there have been a number of problems, some connected to YouTube, some personal, that prevented the channel to grow. So I could really appreciate if you could support the program on Patreon by becoming a member or by one of donations on PayPal. These, these long format videos that you seem to like are quite taxing to produce so any form of help. If you can support materially the channel, just subscribe, like it and share it on your social media. That is really important, but probably even more important is clicking on the videos that are going to appear beside me because this will be telling YouTube that this video was interesting and you are interested in more. And finally, an enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel. You have no idea how important you are. Could get to know each one of you one by one. Hug you and say thank you for doing this. So, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.